what does the panel think with regard to the proposition by side really want from video and TV advertising? And to kick us off, um, I'm going to ask, are advertisers actually actively seeking to move money over from TV to video, i.e. to make use of data targeting interactivity, or is it simply a question of following their audiences? Um, Bav, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Um, yes, clients are actively moving uh, money from TV to video. This year, it's happened probably more, in terms of the percentages, it's actually more this year than ever before. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, clients are now buying into this audience first approach. I think we see some great examples this year where the likes of Game of Thrones or Humans on, on Channel 4, if you look at the first episodes, only 50% of the audience was delivered in live TV. The remaining impacts were delivered through a proliferation of devices, which shows it's quite compelling evidence that an audience first approach is definitely what's required. Um, the second lever is the fact that the TV market is inflating as impacts come out of the market. The cost of TVs increasing because revenue staying the same. Um, and many clients are coming to me talking about 2016 plans and so what we're going to do about this inflation, especially the ones who are buying the younger audiences where we see inflation anywhere between 10 and 20%. Um, it means we're going to them with that audience first approach, which naturally leads to more um, investment online. Uh, and the third thing is, it's a challenge we've had as an industry over the last couple of years. It's actually having a single source panel, which allows you to plan and measure TV online together. Um, what's true for us is we've been able to do that. And I'm sure other agencies are either there or, or thereabouts. And it's having the ability to go to market, to media owners, getting their first party data, integrating that, fusing that with their own proprietary planning tools. And actually, for the first time, allowing us to actually fully understand the optimal investment between TV and line. So, and clients are buying into that and, and they understand that money has to move digitally. Lena, are you seeing a major shift uh, taking place in terms of investment coming in for, to, to buy more media, video media as a media buy? Yeah, I think um, predominantly the budgets we see come from TV budgets um, and that's the kind of starting point and I think um, as more premium inventory is available to buy, video inventory is able to be bought, um, we'll see advertisers kind of accelerate the growth in that area. So I think the key thing is that everything that we can buy online is measurable, and measurable in a different way from standard TV. Mm. So, you know, it's not just about demographics and socioeconomic data, it's about interests and behaviour, and as soon as as advertisers are seeing more of that and seeing how measurable it is, it's giving them opportunity to understand more about their audience and find different ways of finding them through online platforms and online video. I think it's, it's getting tough, though. It's getting hard for advertisers to reach those audiences. Mm. Um, I think kind of uh, agencies and traditionally kind of media planning buyers live in the siloed world of, of TV and and digital, but the consumer doesn't live in that world. Yeah. And the consumer doesn't really give a <laughs> shit or, or care where they watch video. Mm -hmm. They want to watch video on any screen, any device. Yeah. So actually that, kind of, that world is being disrupted by device fragmentation. Um, and whilst that's challenging, it, it kind of creates an opportunity. Because just as technology has changed the consumer world, actually software and technology is starting to change the way that media is, is planned and bought. How kind of brands start to engage with a true cross-screen approach from both an activation or acquisition of media, but then more importantly from a, um, a measurement is, mm -hmm. is really, I think, where the next few strides are, are going to change. And, and then we've spoken a lot today about programmatic. Mm. And programmatic is ultimately buying media through software. And you can do that on digital. You can do that on digital out of home. Now you can do it on audio. And actually, I think the interesting point, and you can do it now on TV in, in the US. So I think. It's an interesting kind of uh, opportunity for agencies to think, okay, how do they work to reach those audiences across any screen device in perhaps a different way that's been done in the past? 
Nick, do you think, from a strategic perspective, that, um, I mean, what's your comment with regard to, I mean, you're obviously now producing more video than ever mm -hmm. before. Um, I mean, presumably that, you know, that revenue is coming from somewhere. I mean, it's not like a bottomless pit that clients have got, you know, this endless stream of media money. I mean, from a strategic perspective, I mean, what, what do you see shifting in the market here from the point of view? Of well, all I'd say is I'd, I'd hope we can stoke the fires to move some money out of TV budgets. I mean, us publishers are the poor huddled masses is, you know, <laughs> begging for the crumbs from the TV businesses and the, and the big American tech businesses. So anything we can do to stoke the fires, to steal that budget away is, is you know, gives us, and video gives us a shot to do that, right? So clearly we want to, and I'm sure I probably speak for every, if there are publishers in the room, every publisher in the room, it will be on your 2016 plan as it was on your 2015 plan, as it was on your 2014 plan to try and find a way as a business that you can, you can you know, create the inventory that you mm. need to take money. But look, let's be realistic. We are an order of magnitude different from a broadcaster. We are never going to commission Game of Thrones. We're never, um, you know, we're totally different businesses. But mm. if we can deliver AV advertising, which probably remains the most effective form of, of advertising if you can get people to watch it, then we want, we want to play our part. So I hope that's true. Um, and yeah, you're right. The budgets aren't bottomless pits. So clearly the vi online video budget is exponentially 60 70 percent up year over year that must be coming from somewhere okay so uh, you know the point is you're not going to commission the next uh, series of game of thrones but i mean the question has to be are the you know are the sell side doing sufficiently enough to you know create um the the inventory that, that there's clearly demand for in the market i mean bab what's your view i think what we've been trying to tell media owners is Firstly, premium inventory is obviously key as, as demand goes up, but actually work with fewer advertisers, create partnerships, integrated partnerships that so you're working with fewer advertisers, creating original bespoke content, uh, which is beneficial for all parties. That's what we're sort of telling a lot of our media houses to, to challenge them to, to work with our clients on. I mean, what, what's premium? I, I think it came up in one of the sessions earlier about evaluating premium um, and kind of Sight, sound, emotion, as you say, kind of, it's always been the tool that kind of drives brand shift. It was always been the tool that's, that's chosen to drive recall purchasing him. And it's always been somewhere that's been surrounded by content, context, environment. So that's mm. kind of premium. It's generally been before professionally created content. Um, but kind of premium is also viewability. Premium to an extent is actually making sure that the right target audience, all these factors kind of actually start to interplay in terms of actually the inventory people are buying. Mm. Uh, it used to be about cost efficiency, actually, how can I reach audiences in a cheap way? Well, actually, yep. how can I start to reach audiences where they see the bloody ad? Yep. How do I start to reach the right audience and pay the right price for that right audience? How do I start to evaluate what the audience has done in terms of completion? Then more importantly, or just as importantly, what's it doing to my brand metrics? All those KPIs, if you like, work towards really validating or justifying the, the, the type or classification of, of premium. Lena, do you think publishers can do more? Um, from the buyer's perspective, every time we see a publisher and you know we're looking at the whole programmatic landscape and when we leave it's what do we really want and it's always more premium video inventory. And I think Nick's completely right and it's not just the content, it's where it is, it's how it's viewed, it's how the user engages. Does the user have an opportunity to see it and engage with it? Also, how long is the content? I mean, yes, publishers are producing a lot of content. Um, are they labelling it in the correct way, necessarily? We, I mean, you know, it's very difficult as a buyer to know exactly what we're appearing in front of. We might know the context, we might know where it is, etc. But which video was our, brand, was our brand in front of? And that's really important to advertisers. And I think the marketplace is changing a little bit in terms of technology, where there is technology that is starting to be able to read more about you know, not just where and is it brand safe, like what video content are you actually appearing in front of? I think from our side, yeah, we see great video content and we see loads of news content and loads of sports content. Um, entertainment to some extent, but there are so many published out there with such great content and video content, but, you know, I think to Piers' point, are they able to get it in front of the right audience? They might have the content there, but are they getting people to watch it? And is mm. that something the publisher needs to do more or find ways to get their consumers to view more videos? So what's the problem, Nick? 
Piers. Piers. Sorry. <laughs> What's I want to call you, Nick? Sorry, That's Piers. Right. That's all right. That's all right. Um, he's much better looking than me and probably wealthier. So, um, <laughs> um, so what is the problem? Yes. I, I feel I, what well, I'm being told off, aren't I? As a You're not being what can told we do, off, What can no. we do more? Um, well, look. I think there are a couple of things that we need to do. The, the first absolute prerequisite that was, is within our control is, as Nick says and Lena says, to create quality inventory. So I, I don't like the word premium because it kind of, premiums actually means expensive and whatever. But I think we all know what we mean, but you know, we certainly need to create the right environment, right? We need to make sure that everything we have from high view through rates, et cetera, it is the right environment. So that's something that we can control. We can clearly control how much of the investment we put uh, into that part of the business. But the truth is, the market will decide the economics. And at the moment, those economics are still quite challenging. The high cost of video, mm. you know, there is a fragmentation of media. You know, TV is very different. I don't know how many TV buying points are there? Three. It's not difficult to, you know, when there's only, you've only got two competitors. We wake up every morning, we probably have 650 competitors. So it is easy, uh, it's easier when you don't have a fragmented supply and a competitive base when you're a publisher. So, you know, quite simply, like I said, we could go out and, uh, and commission the next series of Game of Thrones. Um, we would never get the money back. And we, we, we would, even at 25 million people a month across our, our network, we would struggle to get the eyeballs to deliver it. Because do, do, do you think there's, a, um, uh, there's not the right balance of, of, of price then between supply and demand? Yeah. If there's, there's clearly lots of, of demand mm. because there's not enough supply, mm. but kind of it's, it's not economically valid yeah. at the moment mm. to create that. Clearly, so in it's that way. A, there's a, it's disjointed. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I'm not a TV native, so I don't know the TV market inside out in terms of the trading mechanism. But you know, if you're being paid you know, 18 quid cost per thousand and you yeah. can run one ad, Again, there is the middle ecosystem as well of the ad tech, which is taking their cut. So publish, you know, marketers might be paying 30 or 40 quid, but yep. the publishers aren't seeing that. No. Yep. And no. so that's a real problem. I mean, that's not just video, frankly. And sorry, Tube, you know, Tube Mogul is also right. part of that ecosystem. We don't, we don't make him out of publishers. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, the reality is that, that challenge of that ad technology tax, which yeah. is stripping money away from the publishers, makes investing in video that much harder. Yeah, and that's a, a major problem. I mean, let's be honest, because at the end of the day, it's all about the commercials, and yeah. it has to be. I mean, you know, it's got to make. So we can absolutely do more, and we we, we certainly clearly have. I mean, we have we employ fourteen hundred journalists across the UK. That's a serious amount of cost. I'm not entirely sure what number of those would be highly skilled video production yeah. specialists. So <laughs> is there a question for us that we need to reorientate our business to have more video specialists? Mm. Question possibly. Um, but that's an investment in itself, and Absolutely. you know, and clearly, you know, I mean, this has been a criticism that's been, you know, levelled against most online publishers who are coming from a wordage perspective yeah. that they've not embraced video um, in the same way that they've embraced, you know, the, and the written word. And don't forget, we still have nine hundred thousand people a day who go out and yeah, spend sixty exactly. p buying the mirror. Yeah. So we have to keep yeah. producing a, a printed publication, mm. which you know, yeah. people. 60p a day at 900,000 yeah. is quite a serious amount of revenue. So if I was to go to my CEO and say, I should just get rid of all the text journalists and just hire some video guys, there's some obvious questions about how that would stack up. Absolutely. That's going to take time, that transition. So I'm now going to give you the opportunity to beat up on your colleagues here. Um, do you believe that advertisers are getting enough transparency from their agencies, touching on the points you were making there around the economics? Who's that to me? To you. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm the sell side, right? I don't, I don't care who buys my stuff and how you buy it. Um, <laughs> just exactly. give me the highest price. I mean, like we've got no clients here. To it, it, that's a question more for, for how the sell side operate. We're very transparent. So if any, me, any marketer wants to come and ask how much we charge for your CPM on video, I'll tell you and you can then decide. <laughs> so over to you guys. I mean, Lena, do you believe that clients are getting enough transparency? I think um, clients are getting as much transparency as the sell side, uh, the buy side can actually give them, and um, <laughs> that's a very diplomatic well, answer. I mean, of course. I mean, as uh, as yeah. Viviki, we we only buy transparent inventory. So, I mean, uh, transparent is not just about inventory; it's about how much we're paying for it, how much the data costs, and when you break it down, that's that's available to all of our clients. And it's how we buy and how we optimise. If we can't see what we're buying, we can't make it perform any better. Um, but yeah, there are limitations. I mean, in the ad tech stack, you know, 
we can only tell the technology what we want to buy. Um, once it's kind of in the exchanges and with the networks, yeah. you know, you don't see full visibility. And I think, um, you know, if we o if we only bought what we knew 100% was pre-roll, where it was, that it was going to be in view, mm -hmm. and really quality com content, we'd be able to buy very little, which is why our, we like to go down the private marketplace route with video um, as much as we can. And you know, there's, it means speaking to lots of publishers and setting up lots of connections yeah. and working with lots of SSPs. It's just extremely time consuming. It is very time consuming. You know, no doubt about that. It is, and that's why you need a you know a dedicated programmatic team to be able to do that. And you know, then there's the troubleshooting involved, and you know, connecting all the parties. And I think that you know that effort is worth it. But you know, when you go back to price, yes, we are going to be paying a premium price to buy that private marketplace inventory. If we can balance that with really you know 10, 15 really good inventory sources, where you, the results show that you're buying what you think you're buying. Mm -hmm. That's where you know some of the lower costing inventory sources like YouTube and Facebook, etc., yeah. balance it out. So, Bab, what do you think the obstacles but, are? I think I absolutely agree, but we are continuously learning in this field. Um, there's so much more learning to be done and then educating of clients to be done. And everyone's holding hands as we navigate through this process. The foundations of that is trust. And if a client's not thinking that we've been transparent, then suddenly we've got a big problem. And this big market that we're trying to reach, we're trying to grow this programmatic market, actually understand it and navigate through it, we suddenly lose track of that. Um, so yeah, it's, everything's built on trust and transparency is key. Nick, from a software perspective, what, what's your view? I, I think the, uh, the irony of, of or the legacy of, of programmatic has always been tarnished by lack of transparency, which is ironic because actually through software you probably have more transparency and accountability than, than ever before. Um, and I think as, a, as an industry and a business, thank, thank the Lord, and I, I know most brands and advertisers are pleased that actually the industry has evolved now, but actually there's a lot more transparency that, that they're seeing. Actually, some, some clients have logins. Most kind of trained desks have been integrated within the agency and given full transparency. So I think that that world's, that world's changed from an economic, economic perspective. As Lena says, it's, nothing, it's not just around the price transparency. It's being able to see site by site what exactly you're buying. Mm. Um, things like viewability. Viewability is the best thing that's ever happened to this industry. One, because it, it starts to shake up and drive a much more premium ecosystem. Two, it recalibrates the price of inventory. And three, you start to look at that inventory and, and work out actually kind of what do we want to pay more for. There's no such thing as you know, all inventory or all impressions are, are equal. They're not. Um, so transparency around kind of player size gives you more insight to viewability. Transparency around viewability gives you more insight to actually reach the right audience in the right place. So all these things that are driven by transparency are beneficial for agencies and advertisers. Um, as I said, kind of, it's come a long, long way in the last three or four, four years, which can be beneficial for everyone in this space. We talked, uh, you know, you touched on the fact that you're buying private marketplace, uh, you know, from private marketplaces. I mean, is that driven because brands are uncomfortable with the concept of, you know, potentially there being huge fraud and, and the viewability issues? I mean, what, 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 are, are brands aware of this? I mean, are they, is it kind of part of the conversation that you guys are having with them? I think um, brands are becoming more aware of fraud and transparency issues and things like that. I think, um, you know, as brands become more digitally savvy, it will become more of an education piece on our part um, to, you know, work with the verification companies, you know, and, and educate clients on what the actual issues are and how we're working together to try and combat it. Because it's, it's very easy to, you know, apply all your brand safety tools and all your viewability tools and all your verification tools. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not until you've bought something that you see that there's something wrong with the inventory you've bought. So it's a continuous learning process, using the data and putting it back in and trying to improve it. Um, when we're talking about private marketplace, it is a way we feel very protected in buying, what, uh, protecting us and protecting our advertisers to buy you know, quality audiences and quality environments. And of course, you know, an advertiser loves to see a list of sites at the end of a campaign that they recognize and they understand where the viewer is actually viewing the video inventory. Um, and that's a lot of 
the reason behind it because although brands and we you know it's always encouraged to find your audience brands will still look at context and environment and you know judge the quality of their buy based on that not necessarily you know it's very difficult to prove that whoever's interested in whatever your brand is was on you know eBay or wherever compared to something that's much more relevant to your brand if you think um, and that's that's changed isn't it over the last Again, it's accelerated over the last three years. If you look at the US, for example, there's much more open RTB inventory being bought and less kind of programmatic direct or private marketplace. Yeah. You look in the, in the UK now, it's probably, well, to certain buyers, probably more kind of 60, 40, 65, 35 in terms of programmatic direct. In Germany, I think it's going to be the other way around where it's the, the, the higher percentage will be programmatic direct rather than open RTB. Mm. And it's literally just a, a different state in which each market. Is, has evolved you know, or is involved in from an evolutionary perspective. Um, and actually, when you, you're, you're stuck in a supply and demand constraint, actually, it's, it's a damn sight easier to still automate that buy but agree a price with the yeah. publisher direct, you still automate the transaction through a, a consolidated platform, but actually, you're securing it. Mm. You don't want to be in a world where actually, technically, I might have to bid more for it, yeah. but it's open RTB. I think it's more a question about supply and demand that drives the, 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 the video programmatic direct marketplace than anything else. I mean, um, if concerns about brand safety and forward or display would be traded on a mm -hmm. private marketplace and it's yeah. not. I think this is, um, and I, I, it's interesting because the publisher perspective is slightly different because sometimes we trade with people on a direct basis but they sell on programmatically. So if you asked a sell side view of a programmatic direct versus open marketplace, it would probably be very different to the publisher um, which still sees the market in video as almost entirely, not entirely, probably about 70%. I think it was the IEB um, study was 70% of the market was, was direct. Um, so a tiny proportion is actually done programmatic. But that's not to say that the people we sometimes sell to will go on to execute programmatically selling on. So you get a different perspective of the market. What's your view on brand safety and in terms of the importance that it has for clients? See, for a lot of budgets that come through my team, it goes to the broadcasters so that's and platforms. That's sort of less of an issue. But the networks we do use, I think, they, I mean, personally, I've seen, I think might be able to elaborate, but the, the inventory they're going out and buying is a lot more better. Um, so I'm seeing that less and less of an issue. I still go to sleep at night having nightmares that my client's going to ring me up in the morning and say they've been on a porn site or something like that. But to date, it's not happened. So touch wood, it's, it's not going to be an issue for us. What's your client doing on a porn site at 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, <laughs> clearly. It's just a bit of a <laughs> relaxation time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. That, that You've got to get porn into a panel <laughs> debate. <at some> <laughs> um, so, uh, question. I've thrown you, haven't I? Yeah, you have. Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Flustered now. I'm just thinking about what my husband was doing at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, do advertisers value in-stream advertising that's produced in-house? Are they willing to pay for it? Question. And by that you mean, do they value the content that we produce yes. as yes. a business over and above that we curate? Yes. Uh, our perspective, probably not. We would like to have a more balanced supply pool. Um, clearly we own, we have much more freedom with our own IP and the content that we produce than that we buy in. But there's no question that every publisher is in a race. There's a distribution race. I mean, we've all seen it. You have a clip. That clip will be in your Twitter feed from multiple publishers within about five to 10 minutes of each other. Um, we're in a race for that first eyeball. And that, that or we don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I don't, we don't, if, again, if, a, if, the, if the buy side came to us and said, you know, we'll pay you £100 cost per thousand for the content you produce, that might change the model that we have. But the mm. reality was we could produce all our content in-house and spend a lot of money on it, or we could do it more economically buying in. The price the market pays wouldn't make any difference. It's, take, it's taken on its merits, to be honest with you. And I touched upon it earlier, working with few advertisers, working out actually, can we create something a bit more integrated? Mm. Uh, in, in that instance... Yeah, I think that's votes. a different question, the content marketing question. Yeah, absolutely. But everything's taken on its merits. Is it contextually relevant? Are there enough eyeballs for it? Um, and ultimately, what, what is the price we, we pay for it? Um, providing we've nailed all three of those, then it's just taken as any aim of a buy. 
it's all to do with the evaluation of your of your inventory and um, what you're trying to achieve with it. Um, in stream premium, created by a professional. Yeah. Fantastic, of course. Mm -hmm. Absol absolutely. Well, Any exceptional examples you want to you want to name? Apart from Bev's reference, no. Um, to late at night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, but there, how many kind of so there, how many journalists are there that are producing that? So it really, yeah. really depends on 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 the price and what the, the objectives of the campaign are. Yeah. Um, there's also the kind of this, this this variance between in stream and out stream, and the out stream yeah. point is actually well, there's not enough in stream. Yeah. You know, um, whether it's uh, published to partners like Teeds, who we work very very closely mm -hmm. with, who are great, they've kind of got an infinite amount of inventory. Sure. Because they can just kind of, and they can give that to publishers that they mm. work with. They can create that, but it's evaluating the kind of the right price and what you're looking to do from from each each point. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, kind of no, no, all it, all inventory or, or video isn't necessarily equal. No. It really depends on kind of what you're looking to achieve from that, and the, and ultimately the price from it, or the viewability from it, or the on-target mm. audience, etc. And Lena, do you believe that outstream formats, are they performing? I mean, do you see a significant difference? Oh, yeah, abs absolutely huge difference. I mean, at the moment, we're still trying to figure out where it fits in because it's, it's not video on demand in the sense yeah. that pre-roll is. And it's such a different kind of format. I mean, the whole point of TV advertising is to, you know, find, pe you know, get people when they're engaged in something and, yes, the engagement comes from reading. Interrupt. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> TV. <Disruptive. laughs> the most interruptive four hour format ever known to man. But Karen, sorry. Yeah, so it, it's, I mean, and at the moment the pricing is just not, so the pricing is in line with what we would pay for premium, you know. Yeah. At, you know, pre roll, proper pre roll, click to play pre roll. And, you know, when people hear that it can be bought on a CPM and you pay for that second of time that that user seeing the advertisement for before they can scroll away. I mean, it's just a different, a different area where that user's got the option to engage with it. It has to, the audience targeting has to be so good to mm. get it right. You have to reach the right audience. Otherwise, I mean, you know, why are you going to spend your time watching a video when you, when you're busy reading an article? It's, it's such a different mechanism and yeah. it's different metrics to standard board. I mean, we yeah. can't report back to our clients the same metrics. You know, it looks terrible. Yeah. We have to think about <laughs> how, how to report back. How I mean, do you, How do you evaluate it then? Yes. So, I mean... Means, you're absolutely right. It'd just be really interesting to see, okay, okay, well, if that's, if that's the case, how do I evaluate it? How okay. You... So if you look at a standard board campaign, we're, we're reporting back on, you know, cost per completed views, how viewable it is, view through rates, standard video kind of metrics. Um, we're having to look at it in a different way. And the thing with in Outstream is, yes, it is technically 100% viewable because it's not going to appear until you've arrived at that piece of content. So we're looking more at metrics around cost per viewable completion and cost per, you know, engagement. And yes, I mean, it's... It's, but however, you know, it's not always easy to measure everything else that way. So it's it's very much kind of testing and learning at the moment, and um, finding out, you know, is there certain types of video or certain types of audiences or certain types of content that is actually working really well. And I think one thing we're kind of trying at the moment is, you know, where we're seeing very low completion rates for standard 30-second pre-roll. You know, 30 seconds is a long time to get someone to look. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult for us to get shorter content from yeah. our advertisers, unfortunately. Uh, which is crazy. Which is absolutely insane because it's just taking the one format that's on the TV yeah. and mm -hmm. putting it online and the whole, the whole yeah. engagement is completely different. Yeah. I mean, you know. So we'd love to do more measurement around, you know, yeah. fi five second videos or 10 second absolutely. videos. So we're absolutely. not seeing that many of them, unfortunately. Looking at more like interactive formats, is that the format to use when you're using Outstream because you know you've actually got the, giving the user something to do, giving the users to engage. Is that the time to do it, mm. rather than just watching? If you look at the, the exponential um, increase of of consumption on, on mobile devices, whether it be tablet, you, no one's going to watch a 30 second TV ad on, on a mobile. You know, and, and fun enough, we were with a, a client the other week, and they were talking about actually how they need to start driving there, their creative agencies to start think about. Not just programmatic to that extent, but kind of start to think about how you can reach and engage with audiences and the different devices those audiences are engaging with content in, and 
And it, if, if your audience is more and more mobile, then why are we not, why are we not creating five seconds or 10 seconds? Mm. TV ads and 30 gosh. seconds for, for TV. Do you know what I mean? Just really understanding uh, the medium is the message mm. and, and actually yeah. the, the way that it's being delivered is absolutely key. I think you get yeah. lots of clients who are spending a, a big budgets on massive creatives. Yeah. They want to get their wear out of it, to be honest. Yeah. And that's quite an easy way out is, right, okay, it works for telly, work for digital. Yeah. And we've been talking to clients for the last couple of years on actually, should you be creating four or five different copies yeah. dependent on the device? And I don't think we've nailed it. Some clients, some of our clients are really good at it. They've got a separate TV copy and they make bespoke digital copy, but majority of them, I presume across the industry, are still not creating digital specific copies. And we're still educating these guys on that. Do you see significant, but do you see a significant improvement in the performance of, of what I would describe as a sting format as opposed to a 30 second? Yeah, I think uh, completion rates, um, I just think even just like small tweaks in the copy. Like, yeah. I think uh, there's a, I mean, we've been to, uh, to being around too long. We've been talking about this probably since videos first came in like 2001. Yeah. The main problem you've got is the, the model of one ad per clip. So invariably, if you've had a client that's been paying 25 quid, cost per thousand for a 30 second spot, and the agency goes to them and go, I really think you should run a 10 second ad, he'll go, that's fine, I'm assuming I'm paying a third of the rate. Yeah. Now for publishers, if it was a TV model where you just make up your three minutes worth however many ads you can physically, I um, know TV before you kill me, it's not quite as simple as that, but you can have multiple 10 second ads in a three minute slot, it doesn't compromise the economics of the publisher. But we can't have agencies come to us and say, oh yeah, so we, they want to run a 10 second ad, but they want to pay a third of the price because we have one spot to monetize. Yeah. So unless we can start to run three 10 second spots. Well, the broadcasters do. Well, well, they do, well, and, but again, that's gonna, but again, would a consumer sit through, would they rather sit through three 10 second, which might be the three longest? Well, you, I think ITV run three 30 seconds yeah. on, on desktop. Is that, well, yeah, one minute, one one minute 30, it, one minute 30, yeah. I think. So, I don't think from, we, we need it at a third of the price. I mean, brilliant, uh, job done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 10 second inventory is infinitely easier to buy than 30 second or 40 yeah. second inventory. Well, we would love it, I mean, right? We would love it from a, from a user point of view. Um, because clearly it's our biggest bugbear for, for users is sitting through 30 second spots when our content tends to be short form. Mm. Um, but we can only move as fast as the market. I mean, on, on out, the outstream question is, is interesting, I think. Um, it's, it's been very important to publishers, um, no question, because as, as Nick said, it's unlocked video in inverted commas inventory. I think it's priced, the way we see the market, it's very easy. You have the kind of rich media formats on stand display at one price. Slightly more than that is the, the outstream or in read. If anything, this conference can name, can a naming convention for what it is, but you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's slightly more and then pre-rolls is your more expensive. So for me, it fits right in that slightly more expensive than stand display, slightly cheaper than pre-roll. Seems fair to me. Why, why should it be more expensive than rich media display? It's it's well, I guess. I mean, it's you know, far you more intrusive say, than rich media display. Yeah, but I you mean, you can can't you can't avoid it from a consumer point of view. So, um, on that basis alone, is it intrusive or is it integrated? Well, I always my editors always say intrusive or, or impactful. Delete as your bias requires. Um, <laughs> if you're an editor, you think it's the most terrific format known to man, and if you're a sales guy, you think it's quite brilliant. What do you think the consumer thinks? I think the consumer sees it as just another ad. <laughs> Um, you, know, I, you know, it's it's a difficult one. You can't ask consumers what they think because they'll they'll hate everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they've have we talked about ad blocking yet? They've they've all already. Or is that tomorrow? tomorrow. <laughs> it's all day yeah, tomorrow. All day tomorrow. Uh, I think they've all read Bob Hoffman's latest book. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think the point is about yeah. kind of displaying videos are really really interesting because. Um, in the display world, you've got an abundance of inventory. Yeah. And actually, kind of the concept of context, content, environment is perhaps not really the same relevancy because actually, if I'm hitting a CPA target, that's what I want to be doing. So, viewability to a less extent, although it's, it's scourged, display scourged with viewability issues. It, it, when it comes to video, it's a different inventory ecosystem. Um, there's different metrics, and there's, it, there needs to be a different understanding. And Lena mentioned kind of test and learn earlier, actually. I think the more kind of from the buy side kind of working actually with publishers and learning to evaluate the inventory quality, um, the more um, informed actually both sides could be in terms of the right price and relevancy. And I think um, we're just starting to see that happen now in terms of 
and whether they be trained this or whether they be uh, agency trained this or whoever's doing the acquisition of that media, really start to understand the difference of the inventory quality in the ecosystem in itself. So um, I started off with asking whether advertisers are seeking to move money over from TV into video. And I'm going to end on, you know, do we believe that programmatic TV buying will stem the flow of money from TV to video? Or will it simply increase spend across screens? Bab, over to you. Lovely. Programmatic TV, when it does finally come. When um, it does. When it's like, the, it's, remember the year <laughs> I'm, of mobile? I'm sure, I'm Every sure. year was the year of mobile. Yeah, it is one of those. It's it's one one of those isn't it? But we know eventually it will come. Um, and when it does, I think it will happen in a controlled way, firstly. Um, and it's going to take the media owner, the agency, the client to work in a collaborative way so we can understand the value of it. Once that is done, will it stem the flow to video? Being an optimistic person, probably not. In fact, I think it would stimulate growth. There's a couple of reasons why. I think One, I think it will bring new advertisers into the market. I think it would take Sky AdSmart, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, a large proportion of the advertisers that have bought into AdSmart are either new to TV or new to Sky. That's pretty compelling yes. that there's a market out there. Um, two, um, there are a lot of spots on TV that are not monetized. There's a large proportion of them, zero ratings. But yep. we know somewhere, yep. someone in Dundee is watching that spot at 24 past two in the morning. It's your client again. Yeah, it's probably my <laughs> client, yeah, exactly. Um, and there's opportunity to monetize these spots. He's obviously using two screens. It's two screens. Yeah. Two screens, yeah, clearly. <laughs> it's dual screening. So, um, yeah, on, on those two very reasons, I think there's enough argu argument to say, actually, once programmatic TV does come, um, there'll be value in it for both TV and for video. What's your, what's your view, Lena? I think, um, like, well, you know, the infrastructure just isn't there for it to move at the moment. And What's know. needed? What do you think the major obstacles are at the moment? Oh, well, I don't... I had a, it's just so many. It's multiple. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even trying to understand how it becomes... TV becomes ad-served is yeah. quite, you know, difficult to even get your head, get your head around. around. Yeah. Um, I think AdSmart are, you know, doing really cool things, but, you know, still relatively small scale. Um, I think, you know, the next... The thing that's happening at the moment is, you know, just broadcast VOD moving onto programmatic. And I think, you know, the broadcasters need to feel comfortable with programmatic and how they're trading. And, you know, the tests that we're doing at the moment are, you know, they're very basic. It's just purely mm. using the technology to be able to do it. But it's a stepping stone and it's, it's allowing them to see what it's like and us to tr test. I mean, you know, from our point of view, it's not fully programmatic. There's not the level of audience buying and the level of targeting that we'd normally be used to. But it's a step in the right direction. And I think until that's happened, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be limited and, and obviously waiting for the infrastructure to make it possible. Great. Well, I've just seen the time. And we've got a few moments left for anyone out there who would like to ask this expert panel a question or two. So anyone would like to ask a question? Ah, oh, hands coming up. That's good. What about this gentleman at the back? Could you say your name, please, and where you're from? Hi, yes, my name is Rami. And Hi, Ronnie. I'm, uh, from Euratec. I'm a consultant like yourself. Okay. So I don't know what I do really. <laughs> uh, you're in good the, company. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask is something that I've been hearing throughout all of the different panels today. Uh, all of the buy side guys putting the emphasis on premium traffic, quality traffic, only in player only pre-roll, outstream is video. I mean, they do they actually did this a couple of times. Uh, so uh, if we are speaking about all of these uh, uh, high-end technological buy-side companies, basically telling the advertiser buy premium, mm. uh, it's basically like needing someone between an agency and an advertiser saying buy the billboard on on, you know, on Times Square. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are not willing to, to deal with the, with the media that is a little bit uh, dirtier, the you, remnant. you want to buy jewelry, you don't want to deal with the pay dirt and clean it. So aren't you guys just making the ecosystem overcomplicated to justify the huge chunk of the publisher money you are taking? Oh, hey. <laughs> Man has read Bob Hoffman's book. Um, 
Lena, would you like to point back that? that <laughs> I think the point is that we're trying to make the best out of the not so premium inventory as well um, by using various different you know, optimization techniques and data to actually make that less good inventory work better. I mean, you know, something isn't, if something's not premium, it doesn't mean it's not worth us buying it. You know, it still might have an audience and, you know, what's not worth us buying if it's something that's not going to be seen? Um, you know, there's so much inventory that isn't deemed premium, but actually it's going to work for some advertisers really well. You know, gaming content, you might not want, to, you know, beauty or fashion brand or, you know, finance brand might not want to be in it, but actually brands who are looking to reach their 16 to 34 year olds, that gaming content is where they're finding their audience. It's so premium. that's that, that's premium for them. Um, I, you know, ultimately, it's also about advertising in, you know, being responsible advertising. We don't want to be cluttering the internet with, you know, fueling that rubbish content by putting money behind it. It's about being, you know, r responsible to our brands mm. and, you know, making what we can work, work really well, but also giving them that comfort that actually what they're buying is really good and there's really good stuff to buy out there. Thank you. Um, another question, please, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So it's the last question. You've got your hand up, highest. Hi. Um, Lena spoke about the fact that... I'm sorry, what's your name? I beg your pardon. Sorry, my name's Peter. I'm from Cool. Okay, Peter. Uh, Lena spoke about the fact that often in terms of things like viewability and ad fraud and brand safety, you can only actually analyse that and find out about that after the fact. That can obviously mean clawbacks, which isn't really good for anyone. So do you guys, you guys on the buy side, do you believe that that problem will ever be solved completely by pre-bid data? So there's obviously a lot of technology out there which is hoping to, to improve things like viewability and ad fraud. But from a pre-bid side, are you guys willing to use that data and do you think that it can and will solve those problems? Um, absolutely. I think pre-bid is a really important part of what we do. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's available now, but it has taken a while for it to work on video in the same way as it's worked on standard display. Um, it's something that we use um, in great detail with all of our, all the different technology platforms that we, we use, and some of them have got really great, great integrations with, you know, integral ad science and things like that. Um, you know, the, the thing about pre-bid is it doesn't work, you can't, it doesn't work on everything, it can't read everything. You know, there's so much video inventory that isn't V-paid, and without V-paid, you can't use pre-bid. So, you know, with a marketplace that is limited as it is, I mean, every, we want to trade everything on a pre-bid, you know, is it viewable, and is it a good placement, and is it brand safe? Um, so as the kind of players move onto, and the inventory moves more onto, you know, V-paid technology, and V-paid players will be able to buy more of it like that. But you know, we can't run VPAID on YouTube, and that's a huge kind of inventory source for us. It's, it's using the prepaid technology where we can, but absolutely it's something that I think everyone should be using, even just for, you know, learning. And, you know, it tells you, gives you loads of information. A site of 100 sites that you're buying, you know, when you use your prepaid, you might find that actually, you know, you can only buy 50 or 60% of them. You can start to use um, prepaid. You can look at player size as a proxy for viewability as well. Mm -hmm. And also, kind of, we keep on forgetting mobile. Um, we're now running viewability in mobile, and, and it, it's crazy because in, we're now running uh, viewability in mobile. Um, Barney from Nielsen's not here, but I believe, kind of, I believe, kind of, on-target audience on mobile should be released in Q4. It's a DAR, or the old OCR. So actually, you can start to buy on-target audiences, viewable impressions on mobile with video. It's kind of, we just keep on forgetting about videos. We don't think we think in that true cross-screen way. Mm -hmm. and, but it's something we really need to start thinking about. Well, on that uh, thorny issue, um, we've run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank my expert panel this afternoon and put your hands together and uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.